In the spirit of evolving towards a stronger democracy, I'm going to ask that everybody stand and just join me for a pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We're going to try to keep this presentation, slides show presentation, to about 30 minutes. I want to start with a partial list of sources where I found information, most of it over the last nine months. Uh, the first book that you see, An Enormous Crime, 2008, uh, Congressman Bill Hendon from North Carolina and Elizabeth Stewart, whose father was missing in action in uh, Indochina. Now I say Indochina rather than Vietnam because the war extended into Cambodia and uh, Laos. We'll look at a map to see exactly how those are important neighbors to North and South Vietnam. And so this is the book here. It is still in print. An Enormous Crime, uh, you can order from Village Booksellers on the square here in Bellows Falls. It's about $30 for a brand new copy, or you can go online, Amazon, and find used copies. It is still in print. And then the second printed source was The Bamboo Cage, paperback. It came out earlier in 1994. And it was written by Nigel Cathorn, and there should be an E at the end of Nigel's last name. Uh, this is the book, it's called The Bamboo Cage. Uh, not many photographs or maps in it. This is book ba basically eyewitness testimony, interviews that were conducted by the CIA, uh, by the Defense Intelligence Agency, and the Department of Defense. And uh, it's unedited, so, and a lot of this is also from uh, the sources uh, released or, uh, yes, released, uh, formerly uh, confidential, declassified was the word, declassified documents uh, from not only the, our government, but also from the Soviet government, and the Vietnamese government. And then a couple of YouTube sources, the Robert Garwood interview, we'll find out who Robert Garwood is uh, in the second half of this talk. And also POW's Left Behind, a documentary by Dr. Paul Carter, also on YouTube. And Preston Stewart, who narrates a documentary called Operation Pocket Change, in which he goes through the uh, failed mission to rescue 30 American POWs that were being held in a secluded camp in Laos. So we'll learn more about that. Also, I want to bring to your attention, uh, online you can always find an update as to the situation for MIAs, uh, whether they are still MIAs or if they have been classified as POWs, in which they've been located somewhere. And you can go to this website, pownetwork.org, okay, and go to the heading POW BIOS, and listed alphabetically is every service member and also civilian that was lost in Vietnam, either not accounted for, missing in action, or accounted for, either died, killed in action, or uh, presumed to be still or was in captivity. So, we're going to do a little geography first to get better oriented. And it's always good to start home. So. Uh, when, I, when I hit Vermont, let me know. No, that's Texas. This should be easy. 
No, it's not Wisconsin, it's California. The mid, of course, is Michigan, that's correct. And there's Vermont. There we are. Now, to verify that, oh, we're not going to verify. So we've gone from an unmarked map of the United States to an unmarked, unmarked map of the world. And here we have the seven continents. This is Asia. And right along here, this big kind of fat peninsula below China is Southeast Asia. And that's where we're going to be focusing for the next 25 minutes. There we go. So, United States, also by the way, this map is a little distorted. You see the central part is rather small in comparison with the actual size of the land masses on the bottom and the top. Greenland is really not that big. Greenland is not bigger than the United States, for example. Be that as it may. Here we are, you can see Vietnam. This is a more recent map. This map is after 1995. So Vietnam is kind of like a curly cube. Kind of like a corn chip, right? And here is Cambodia. Kampuchea, it was called in the late 70s when the Khmer Rouge ran it. And up here is Laos. Thailand, where many Americans Many Americans have gone to retire is right here. And you see Australia, the Philippines, ba, 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 where are we? The Philippines are right here. Now I mention that because the Philippines in the 70s had Clark Air Force Base. And during Operation Homecoming, which we'll get to in a couple of minutes, uh, that's where the POWs were flown to, Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. The base is gone today, no longer there. And they were checked by uh, Army medical staff before being flown further uh, east, I guess you would say, to being received in, uh, I believe it was San whoops, I believe it was San Francisco, and I've got a book in there. All right. Now a closer look at where we are going to be focusing. So, this, this map dates from 54, okay? We're going to go back about nine years earlier to begin the story. Here is North Vietnam. This is South Vietnam. This is called the 17th parallel, according to the map uh, demarcation. This is the demilitarized zone. Today, there's the demilitarized zone, if you remember, between North and South Korea. Well, they tried the same approach with Vietnam and it didn't work. This is Laos, and this is Cambodia. Over here, this large mass is Thailand. So, here we've got everything filled in the names. Vietnam, uh, a couple of important places you may have heard the names of. Hanoi is the capital of North Vietnam. Haiphong is the harbor, and Hanoi needed a harbor to receive material that the Soviet Union and China were sending to them to fight the Americans. Well, at first the French, and we'll get to them in a minute. And uh, down here, this is Hue, uh, this is um, Da Nang, which people may have heard about. Uh, we go down here quite a ways to uh, it says here, Ho Chi Minh City. Well, before the fall of Saigon, it was called Saigon. And we're going to find out who Ho Chi Minh was in a, in a moment. This is the Delta, Mekong Delta, and of course, Kampuchea, or uh, Cambodia it's called now, and of course, Laos. This island, by the way, belongs to China. Okay, so this is Ho Chi Minh, 
He was affectionately referred to as Uncle Ho, H-O, and his name means Bright Spirit. Ho Chi Minh means Bright Spirit in uh, Vietnamese. A little bit about his background, why he became the leader of an independent Vietnam. His father, uh, this was around uh, 1900, his father was a magistrate, a judge. Uh, his father wanted not only uh, sovereignty from French colonial power, independence for Vietnam, but he also uh, was troubled by the treatment of peasants who were basically living a life of a medieval serf under a French system called la corvée. Corvée means hard work. And uh, as a magistrate, he tried to impose what justice he could in dealing with landlords, landowners, who would take advantage of the, the peasants. And so this greatly influenced his son. And uh, the son actually went to a French lycée or high school, college, in Hue, which we saw as a coastal city about halfway up the coastline of Vietnam. And uh, the son also, through his father's influence, grew up supporting an uh, independent um, Vietnam, but he also knew that he had to work the system if he was going to get anywhere, and that's what he did. He stayed with his studies, he got out of the uh, lycée, which is like I said, like a high school, high school college, and he uh, studied Confucianism. Now, Confucianism is the, are the teachings of Confucius uh, centering on balance of family life and balance of society. All right, a very social approach. Not an individual approach. Not me, I have my rights, my, my uh, privilege, my... my uh, my priorities, but the community first, the family first, the community first. So, um, he left Vietnam, and he's about 1910, he started 1912, he started working on steamers. And he went around the world, and this is how he traveled, on a steamer, passenger steamer. And he learned, he went from being a dishwasher, he learned to be a cook, and I'd say he stayed doing this off and on uh, almost to World War II. The teens, the 20s, the 30s, he uh, came to be a pastry chef. Uh, all the time he was doing this, he would stop in different cities and uh, spend a number of months and then find another ship to work on. And so he actually was in Paris because he spoke French. Anybody with an education in Vietnam spoke French. He uh, actually was in New York and Boston. He actually found, he found a job in a hotel in um, New York, I believe, and he worked there for uh, a, a year. Uh, all the time he would stay within the local Vietnamese community, and there were sizable communities because the Vietnamese, the educated people that um, weren't happy with the French system of, of governance left the country and tried to get a better life. And of course, you're going to have some people who say, I'm going back and I'm going to help overthrow the French government. And so uh, he did. Interesting thing, he um, was short of money one time. This was in the 30s. And in his circle of friends or supporters for a free, independent Vietnam, he informed the French authorities about somebody's location. Why? Because he needed the money. He wanted the reward, and he, they, he knew that they, the French government would not kill this person. They put him under a house arrest for the rest of his life to keep him out of circulation, but they did not kill him. They did not put him in prison. And I think Ho Chi Minh knew this, that that's why he was able to play with this guy's life for the reward money. Uh, 
very pragmatic. He, later in the late 30s, he married once. He married a Chinese woman. Why do you think he would marry a Chinese woman? Why would that be useful to him later on? Any ideas? He didn't know Chinese, and he knew he needed to learn the Chinese language. So he said, I'm going to have a Chinese wife. Also, he needed somebody to keep his house. And he had children, and so I'm sure he was very interested in having a son. Interesting man. Uh, he comes back to Vietnam in time to help repel Vichy government, because even though France was defeated by Germany, the Vichy government, which was friends with the Nazis, not only maintained power in half of France, okay, but also in the former colonies, like Vietnam. So he led guerrilla activities against two parties, Vichy France, and the other party would be, who were we also fighting in World War II? We were fighting the Germans and the Japanese. Very good. So they were kicking out two different, <laughs> trying to expel two different armies. Uh, United States, of course, uh, ended the war uh, sooner rather than later with dropping the bombs. The Japanese pulled out uh, earlier, I think in 44. Vichy government was being, the, the, uh, the Germans were driven, Vichy government were driven out of France in 44. So it was very good time for him to come in as a leader of an independent Vietnam. And so, here we are. That's the flag of Vietnam or North Vietnam, now it's Vietnam. This is the palace in Hanoi. Uh, this is um, Ho Chi Minh, which was his adopted name. He wasn't born with that name, he gave it to himself. Uh, broadcasting an independence speech in uh, August 10th, I think, 1945. But, Here we go. Uh, this is just goes over what we talked about. Interestingly enough, uh, when things were tried, when things started to settle down between the Allies, Soviet Union, Britain, France, and the United States, Ho Chi Minh went and tried to get in touch with Truman. He wanted Truman's support for a, an independent Vietnam. He did this also at Versailles during the signing of the Treaty of Versailles outside of Paris in 1919. He wanted to talk with Woodrow Wilson about an independent Vietnam. Woodrow Wilson was not the right person to talk to. He wouldn't even see him. He rebuffed him. Uh, evidently, having a good relationship with France was more important than being favorable to a possibility helping with the uh, independence of Vietnam. That was one missed opportunity. Second missed opportunity, Truman never got the letters from uh, Ho Chi Minh. This is, happens in different administrations. The president's people filter information they don't want him to get. Truman never got the letters in 49 from uh, Ho Chi Minh. The people around him discarded the letters and never told Truman that uh, this potential communist leader is interested in our help for an independent democratic Vietnam. So second time we missed an opportunity. In my opinion. So, what happens? The French flex their muscles again, and there is a war, Indo Chinese War. The war lasts till 54. 
when there is a big push against a northern city and the uh, forces of Ho Chi Minh, they were called the Viet Minh, M-I-N-H, actually uh, captured a whole garrison that was protecting the city in North Vietnam and um, the French had had it. They, were, they withdrew. These are French POWs. Not just French, but Moroccan, because Morocco was also Algiers, because Morocco and Algeria uh, were also French colonies. And so uh, these are Viet Minh soldiers. This is August of 54. And uh, this again, here you see the, the yellow star, careful, yellow star on a red field, that's a flag. These are people in Hanoi cheering the Viet Minh, who are managed more or less by uh, Ho Chi Minh, who actually was a good military strategist. If you look up here at this uh, cafe sign, it says, Au rendez-vous des élégantes. French, obviously, and it was a French cafe. Uh, a lot of the buildings that weren't destroyed later on in the war with the Americans, French architecture, churches, public buildings. Okay. Whoops, let's go this way. Now, this is interesting. I came across this in a picture shoot. These are Viet Minh. One of them has a banjo. They're smiling. They look like Americans, perhaps, that uh, they're smiling with. This is 1954. But if you look up here, this is in German. It says, Gute Reise, means have a good trip. Und wasch Heimke. I'm not sure what wasch means. Uh, I almost want to say the Bosch, French, for uh, kind of a derogatory term for the Germans that the French had, the Bosch. I think this is a Vietnamese spelling of Bosch, V-B, okay? So <laughs> they're calling them Bosch. Uh, and these are Germans. Uh, have a good uh, trip home to your loved ones. or in leave it. Now, why were Germans in North Vietnam? Which Germans do you think were in North Vietnam? The East Germans or the West Germans? This is 1954. That's right. These are East Germans because all the communist nations, the Soviet bloc, want to support budding communist rules or regimes. So they supported Ho Chi Minh, they supported the Viet Minh, and this is a going away, going back to East Germany. Okay. Uh, also, as I mentioned before, this is where uh, there's a demarcation, a demilitarized zone halfway down the country, the 17th parallel, North Vietnam, South Vietnam. Now, after here's the DMs, demilitarizing. 1954, there were talks of having free elections for both North and South and having the two reunited. The United States, though, insisted on the United Nations running the election. And the North Vietnamese, uh, Viet Minh, and also uh, Russia, Soviet Union, and China were against it. So they didn't have, the U.S. didn't have the votes it needed, I think, for the Security Council to be stronger in advocating for a free election, supervised by the U.N. So what happened is there was a period of 300 days in, from 54 to 55 in which you had free movement. If you lived in the South and you wanted to go into the communist part of the country, you could freely go up here and resettle. 
By the same token, if you were here in the north, especially if you were a Catholic, remember, Vietnam is mostly, not mostly, but largely Catholic because of the French. French are Catholic. So, in, during that 300-day free movement period, almost one million Vietnamese went from here to here and resettled because they knew that this, kind of like the Berlin Wall, once that wall is up, you're not going to the other side. Demilitarize them. Okay. So, you know, they voted with their feet, as goes the expression, and so they came down here. And I'm sure that was an embarrassment to Ho Chi Minh, but anyway. All right, so why are we looking at Cuba? Why are we looking at the Bay of Pigs? Because there's a learning lesson here. There's a learned teaching moment here that the Vietnamese picked up on. Bay of Pigs was uh, an invasion planned before the Kennedy administration took office. It was planned by the CIA. Uh, I believe it was, I'm, I'm not sure if Eisenhower, President Eisenhower knew about it, but there were 2,500 uh, Cubans that had left Cuba after the fall of the dictator. It's not Martinez, I forget his name. Anyway, Cuba uh, under, let's call him Martinez, was largely run by the mafia. Uh, it was kind of like a, a large version of um, Las Vegas with lots of agriculture, sugar cane mostly, bananas, tropical fruits. Uh, the mafia lost everything. A lot of wealthy people living in Cuba, non-mafia also lost everything because the state confiscated under Fidel Castro, the state nationalized all the resources, private and other, private as well. And so the band pigs, uh, Kennedy learns about it doesn't think it's a good idea, so what he does is he says, okay, send them over there, but I'm not going to give them air cover. And that was the death knell for this Bay of Pigs invasion. You had, I think, 2,800 uh, uh, Cuban nationals that had been living in South Florida. They came over in a flotilla that they organized themselves and they landed here. This is the Bay of Pigs. And of course, Castro knew. And the Cuban defense forces were waiting for them. Because you always have traitors. You always have people that tell the other side what the next play is. That's what happened. They begged for air cover. Kennedy would not give them air cover because he didn't like where this was going. Well, 2,000 of those 2,800, 2,500 were captured. Normally what would have happened is they would have been shot. Mock trial shot, boom. But, and this is where the Vietnamese were taking notes. Castro says, these men are worth more to me alive. I don't want them in my country sowing discontent, being anti-revolutionary, but they're worth something to the people over in the United States to their families. I'm going to hold them for ransom. So what <laughs> Castro said, he presented the Kennedy administration with a list of materials he wanted. Uh, and um, first of all, all the military stuff was, uh, had to be taken off the list. Eventually, Castro settled for humanitarian aid, agricultural aid, tractors, seed, um, pesticides, then uh, hospital uh, medicine, etc., x-ray machines, that sort of thing. And uh, it took two years in negotiation, most of it through Robert F. Kennedy, who was John F. Kennedy's um, Attorney General. And uh, after the second Christmas of captivity, Castro released them in exchange for this shipment. And there was a big celebration in Miami at a stadium. 
And uh, that was it. So, the Vietnamese, as I said, were listening. And so, moving along, Gulf of Tonkin incident, April 4th, 1964. This is the Gulf of Tonkin. Hanoi is up here. Haiphong Harbor is here. Uh, this island here, again, is part of China. We had U.S. Navy vessels here performing intelligence up and down, actually in North Vietnamese waters. And so what happened? There was a there was a reaction to the presence of the, this destroyer, DD-731, the USS Maddox. My personal belief is they probably went into North Vietnamese territorial waters. I'm not sure if this was direct, this was um, provocation or if they were just being a little bit too bold in, in, in showing their presence and gathering intelligence. But they did get a reaction from the North Vietnamese. If you see here, this picture was taken from the deck of the Maddox. One, two, three high-speed North Vietnamese torpedo boats came to intercept uh, the Maddox. And they actually fired a couple of the torpedoes. Uh, aside from some machine gun fire, because they have 50 caliber machine guns, I'll show you what these things look like. All right, some torpedoes here. Kind of like a PT boat, right? And there's the gun. And um, uh, I think two of the three were heavily damaged. Again, the only damage done to the Maddox was some machine gun fire. None of the torpedoes hit the Maddox. This was August 4th, all right? August 8th, through either an intentional miscommunication or a real miscommunication, it was rumored that another destroyer had been attacked by North Vietnamese uh, torpedo boats. It was false. It was a false flag. But it was enough for Johnson. This was after November 63. This was enough for Johnson, Kennedy's vice president, now president, to ask Congress for uh, authorization to use force in protecting American vessels. Hence the start of the Vietnam War. Now, the start of the first POW was August 10th. All right? The Maddox got hit, gets hit or approached or harassed is a better word. The Maddox gets harassed August 4th. August 10th, the first plane, a U.S. plane, is shot down by the North Vietnamese. And here he is, Lieutenant Junior Grade uh, Everett Alvarez, that's his plane, in back from the flight deck of a aircraft carrier. And he is on a bombing mission, see the bombs here, uh, over North Vietnam. He gets hit, his plane comes down, he becomes the first aviator pilot POW, 1964. And he's going to be held until Operation Homecoming in 73. So, let's spend just a minute with Lieutenant Alvarez. Here he is, shortly after he was shot down, the North Vietnamese had already started a Museum of Imperialism. What do you think they would put in their Museum of Imperialism? Lieutenant Alvarez Flight Hub. We are the imperialists in, this, uh, in their eyes. Imperialists because we are in their country. Hanoi, 1965. So this is actually a little later. Uh, it's in 65, not 64. Okay, um, this is in 65. I'll show you a picture of him later on. Here he is. Smiling guard. 
Here he's in sandals. Generally, the sandals are recycled car tires. He's in his PJs. He's, this is vertical striped prison uniform. He's in a compound, probably in Hanoi. And you can see he's looking a little gaunt. He does survive captivity. All right. This is important. This is the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This is why Laos gets involved in the war and Cambodia, because the North Vietnamese are using this trail to supply their forces in South Vietnam. Hence, we're going to have POWs in three countries, not one. Also, who do you think helped them build this trail? Who have they learned from as far as holding POWs and keeping them for ransom? What little island nation, not little, off the South Florida coast? Cuba. Castro sent over 7,000 workers and civil engineers to carve out of the jungle and the highways this roadway, which is gravel. It's not like I-95, it's gravel. Not an interstate. But it's built to handle trucks, heavy machinery, and bring it down here to where the action is. 7,000. Here's a group of Vietnamese cleaning up after part of the Ho Chi Minh Trail has been bombed by U.S. aircraft. The cone hats because of the temperate, the uh, climate. Everybody worked. Now, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, part of it now, is a motorbike trail for tourists. And this is you can get on your two-wheeler, dirt bike, motorcycle, and you can actually go down this part, this stretch of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, goes through Laos. It stops short of Cambodia, which is down here, and you can go around to Da Nang. So it's a tourist destination now. Here we are the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And if you're interested, there's a website, travelvietnam.com. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? It looks hot, too. This one I like. There's a tank that's been turned over by bombing and something else that looks like rusty metal. But see the mountains, this is what the trail had to be carved through. The terrain is uh, very impressive. And again, dirt bike. All right, so where are we now? We're in 1968. It's the Lunar New Year called Tet, which is a big celebration in Vietnam. The North Vietnamese under Ho Chi Minh decide that this would be a good time while people are celebrating Tet to attack. And so these are U.S. supplied uh, personnel carriers, armored personnel carriers. This is a Vietnamese soldier outfitted by the U.S. We're fighting with him. And uh, the North Vietnamese decided, or the Viet Cong, decided to attack cities and bring the war home to people who just had a notion that there was fighting in the countryside. They attacked every city in South Vietnam, including Saigon. This is in 68, June, uh, January 30, 68. U.S. soldier with an IV bottle, wounded in battle. See the sandbag protection. And you can't see what's going on. Everything is covered with uh, growth. 
There's an area under heavy fighting. These are US GIs. This one looks like he's wounded. This looks like the remain of some type of building and fires in the background. This is the Tet Offensive. The North Vietnamese, with the help of the Soviet Union and China, threw everything they could at us with the hope that they could end the war. All right. Later on, after the Tet Offensive, which actually worked more against the South than it did the North because the South said, what, what are we doing? Uh, what are we doing here with U.S. involvement? Johnson decides not to run for re-election. He makes his decision March 31st, 1968. Uh, Hubert Humphrey decides to throw his hat in the ring. He becomes the Democratic choice at the Chicago Convention, which is disrupted by riots. Police riot, when the police uh, go after you in a civilian riot. And so he doesn't see, see a way out. He, uh, he's just worn out from uh, the war. We had civil rights. Uh, issues. We had a number of issues going on in the 80s or 60s were a very, uh, very chaotic uh, decade in many respects. So he decided not to run. Richard Nixon decided to run again after losing to John F. Kennedy. Now, this picture was taken in 72, I believe. This is Richard Nixon in his second term, or going into his second term, 68, 72. And this gentleman here is still with us. He's about 100 years old. His name is Henry, Henry Kissinger, that's right. And um, he is our envoy to Vietnam. He's our negotiator at the Paris Peace Talks. He's the one who deals with this gentleman, Le Docto. Le Docto is a representative for Ho Chi Minh died in 89, so there's another president. Not a, another, there's a president. I'm trying to think of his name. D, 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 D. Oh, Tom. Yeah, President Tom. President Tom mm -hmm. uh, now is in control of North Vietnam. Le Docto is his envoy to the Paris Peace Talks. This is Henry, and this is the Docto. And uh, they've just, um, they're in negotiations in Paris in November of 72. Okay. And uh, the issue of healing the nation comes up. And the North Vietnamese interpretation of healing the nation means you rebuild everything you destroy in our country. North Vietnamese had a system whereby they had block watchers, people that were responsible for everybody who lived on that block. And one of the duties of a block watcher in Hanoi, let's say, or another North Vietnamese city, is to keep records of what's destroyed after a bombing raid hospital, school, park. Even if a park bench is destroyed, it goes in the little book. And so, Le Docteau presents all these calculations of damage just in North Vietnam. And the amount he comes up with is 3.5 billion. We want you to pay for this as part of our peace accord. Henry Kissinger, knows the atmosphere in uh, Congress is not going to be generous. So he kind of stalls. Le Docteau gets upset. In late November, he walks out of the Paris Peace Talks, November 72. And so Nixon, in a move to get Le Docteau with the North Vietnamese back at the negotiation table, what does he do? over the Christmas holiday. 
This was a big issue. I right? 72, I was uh, 16. Christmas bombing during our Christmas holiday into the new year. They bombed, they, 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 it was like a carpet bombing of Hanoi. Le Ducteau, uh, his house was missed by about 50 feet by one of those bombs. Did a lot of damage. And so the North Vietnamese did come back to the negotiating table in February. And what do you think they brought with them? A readjusted bill for the damages. Now it was 4.7 billion to rebuild everything you've destroyed. And if you do that, we will comply and release or give you accounts of all your missing in action. Well, you can see where this is going. <clears throat> all right, little math here. We know that the Vietnamese, or the North Vietnamese, in 72, this is wrong, this got by me somehow. We know through the CIA, Department of Defense, and also communiques that we intercepted between the North Vietnamese and the Soviet Union, Moscow. We know that they held Vietnam, just Vietnam, held 1,205 American uh, prisoners of war. Not just men, but also there were some doctors and nurses, there were also civilians included in that figure. 1,205 held by the Vietnamese, North Vietnam, in 72. 591 were released as a, as a condition in the Paris Peace Talks. March of 73, these guys were flown to Clark Air Force Base for medical help if they needed it. That means that there were 614 unaccounted for. Where were they? Now you add to that, and this again, CIA figures, our figures, up to 300 being held in Laos because they shot down a lot of planes in Laos and maybe between 50 and 100 held in Cambodia. Most of these people, most of these held were pilots and air crew. From 1964 to 1972, we lost 1,067 aircraft over Indochina, over these three countries. We lost those crews. They were either killed outright, or they were captive, they died in captivity, or they were lucky enough to be placed somewhere where they were kind of kept on ice for negotiating purposes. Just like the Cubans did not shoot the, uh, the invaders, the Bay of Pigs incident. They kept them and used them as bartering chips. Ah, but here's the monkey wrench. Nixon, through Kissinger, wants to put Vietnam behind him. Why? Because he's now facing Watergate. And this is why, this was the monkey wrench in my opinion. This is the Daily News, yep, and it's August 6th, 1974. And this fellow is a senator, and he's telling Richard Nixon, we know that you did not order the break-in of the Democratic headquarters, but we have it on tape that you helped cover it up with your counsel, John Dean. You're guilty of that. And we have, there's bipartisan support to impeach you on three articles. You don't have the numbers. We will impeach you. This is a Republican telling another Republican, Richard Nixon. You don't have a chance. So, the preceding, almost the preceding year, we're talking August 74, August 
maybe later 73, dealing with Watergate, kind of forestall the inevitable. So for Vietnam, it's forgotten. The Viet North Vietnamese are waiting month after month for this money, rebuilding money, that 4.7 billion that they were promised in these peace accords. But this is why they called him, some people called him Tricky Dicky. In the Paris Peace Accords, it just states humanitarian aid. There's no figure. Nixon gave through Kissinger a letter apart from the Paris Peace Accord stating the 4.7 billion figure, but it's a one letter, a piece of paper. So Le Docteau has it and says, where's the money? Where's the aid he promised us? And Nixon is too concerned with Watergate and trying to save his presidency. And so they keep, Kissinger keeps brushing off the North Vietnamese. And finally, they lose their patience. Nixon says goodbye. This is August 10th, 1974. He's the first person, president, to resign because of uh, pending impeachment. Gerald Ford, who I believe is there from Michigan, uh, is his vice president and takes over. He runs for election and loses because the Republicans have lost also a lot of support. So what happens? Back to Vietnam. This is a pretty famous picture. This was taken April 30th, 1975. What happened between 74 and 75? Well, the North Vietnamese got tired of waiting for the money. Uh, they sensed that it wouldn't come anytime soon. And so they said, well, we're not bound by the other articles of this peace accord. We're going to attack South Vietnam. Now, interestingly enough, in the peace accord, they were allowed to keep 200,000 men in South Vietnam, in the interior. 200,000 men already in South Vietnam that were allowed to stay there per the peace accord. They decided January 75 to start an all-out offensive against the South. It took maybe four months, but they reached Hanoi. They are at the, in the suburbs of Hanoi, and these are all people, some Americans, but most Americans, the, the American military pulled out. These are civilians and Vietnamese military and civilians, Vietnamese civilians leaving because they're afraid of what the North Vietnamese will do to them once they come in and occupy not just Saigon, but the rest of South Vietnam. Here we have a U.S. military uh, helicopter, U.S. military personnel escorting civilians onto this helicopter so that they could be flown out of Saigon before it's totally engulfed with the North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong. Here is a North Vietnamese tank, courtesy of the Soviet Union. I like this. Look at the tracks. Just kind of rub your face in it. They come, they, it's like going on the lawn of the White House. Bust through the gate. Well, they haven't gone through the gate yet, but they go around this fountain, and then they head towards the presidential palace in Saigon. Again, this is around April 30th, 1975. There they are, busting through the gate to the presidential palace. The president was Tu. Tu was a former military man, and uh, Tu is in Taipei. He left Saigon. And you know where he eventually settled? Boston. Tu lived to be, I think, he lived until the 90s. He, uh, he retired and lived a very 
quiet life in the suburbs of Boston. Again, the flag has changed somewhat, the red and blue. There they are in front of the presidential palace. I would say it was built by American taxpayers maybe um, 10 years ago, 10 years before. So, this is going on. Americans' attention is more on Richard Nixon, Watergate, those Republicans, whatever. And they don't want to even think about Vietnam. The nightmare is over. But it's not over for the military POWs, American POWs, that were left behind. So this is where we're going to pick up next time. So post-1975, after the fall of South Vietnam. OK. We are going to go through three, actually four scenarios. First scenario is, do we buy back these POWs through humanitarian aid? There is an attempt to do that in Laos, and we'll talk about that attempt. Do we steal them? Uh, this again was another uh, camp, or prison camp in Laos, where um, we tried to steal or bring back, under cover, 30 uh, American POWs. Again, many of them are flyers, air crew. Or, and this was kind of like the fallback, do we just ignore that they're all over there? And ignore the sightings of Caucasians, ignore the uh, intelligence surveillance fly-by photographs that show clearly distress signals or camps where these men are being held. And then there's a fourth uh, group, and these are the people that voluntarily, Americans voluntarily stayed there and deserted. We're going to look at one young man who was an army, uh, not an army ranger, but was in the infantry, and he decided to stay in Cambodia and uh, start a family there with a Cambodian wife. We're going to talk a little bit about him as a representative of a small group of men, that dis Americans, that decided to stay there. Uh, they essentially deserted or they left their post without permission and uh, started a new and very dangerous, difficult life. So that's where we are. So next time, as I said, Wednesday, I didn't say, Wednesday, December 6, 7 p.m., here at the Rockingham Public Library, I want to thank Ian Graham, who's the director of the Rockingham Public Library. Thank you, Ian. And I want to thank Alex Radman for taping or filming this slideshow talk. Thank you, and I hope you found this interesting. See you next time.